بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الواحد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا احد وصلاة والسلام على خير من قال وحد الله سبحانه وتعالى سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم على اله واصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمه وبركاته welcome back now to the second part in our introduction to uh, Sunni theology, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Uh, my goal here is to help you just understand this text. I'm going to be avoiding, for those of you who've studied this or engaged this, some of the you know important arguments and discussions that you can find actually explain this text in almost 30 lessons uh, on the Swiss page, alhamdulillah, and actually translated this and wrote a brief explanation of this that you can find on Amazon called Essentials of Islamic Faith. It says for parents and teens, but it's like really for everybody. Uh, Alhamdulillah. And in front of us, as I said before, is this one page, mashallah, right here, uh, which is a, a really nice text that gives you this foundation. And what we, what do I mean by foundation is that studying this should accomplish really four things. Number one, it should allow us to deal with any of our own doubts or concerns that we have in the realm of theology. So it's going to strengthen our iman bi'iznillah. Number two, it's going to increase our capacity to make sense of a chaotic world. It's going to provide us lenses, right? To see clearly through the deception, the chaos um, of the dunya, of the temporary world. Number three, because of that, it's going to allow us then to increase our ta'alluq, our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with faith, and to expand our ability to become people of ihsan, to live as though we see Allah Azza wa Jal, Alhamdulillah. And then of course, the fourth and fifth, fourth is to defend Al-Islam from the notions of its enemies or even the inadvertently ignorant people who may even be Muslim. And then the fifth is to call to the Haqq. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Right, we have to call to the truth. It's a command of Allah. Qul hadihi sabili ad'u ila Allahi ala basira. I call to Allah ala basira, meaning on deep knowledge, a deep understanding of the situation. So last time, alhamdulillah, we began, and we're just going to read up until the point that we stopped, just alhamdulillah to stick uh, with the text. So Sheikh Ad-Dardir, he says in Al-Aqeedah Al-Tawheediyya, rahimahullah, naf'ana Allah ta'ala bi'ilmihi fi darini ameen. Qala bismillah rahman rahim after saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim with the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, يجب على المكلف معرفة ما يجب لله تعالى ولأنبيائه وملائكته الكرام فيجب لله تعالى عشرون صفة So he says the first primary obligation upon any responsible person is to know, is to know, mashallah, is to have, you know, the ability to think and conclude ma'rifah of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this book is going to teach us the sharia, understanding of what is ma'rifah of Allah. As Al-Qadi Abu Bakr, he mentions, and I, I actually have this in, in the explanation of the Masses Creed, which I'm working on, alhamdulillah, hopefully will be finished by the end of the summer. The very beginning in the introduction, when I talk about public theology, what is a public theology? One of the challenges of postmodernity uh, is that, you know, these kind of things about God and faith are like coming from an internal set of optics, not external. But we believe that this is called, you know, <laughs> very profoundly, we believe that we have to be taught these things. And that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something, faith is not something that's just off a of premonition or how I feel or la. Uh, as Al Qadi Abu Bakr argues brilliantly, um, that. Faith is something which has to be learned through revelation, through revelation. Of course, that's a different discussion. So the first obligation is to know, how do we know who Allah is? Of course, you think, but th that thinking has to be guided by revelation. Because to believe in God on my own terms makes me God. A'udhu billah, it's kind of like a subtle form of idolatry. So I have to surrender and I have to accept what God has taught me about himself, what the prophets have taught us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
فيجب على المكلف معرفة ما يجب لله تعالى. So first we have to know what is obligatory for us to believe about Allah, what's impossible, what's unacceptable for us to believe about Allah, and then what is probable in our faith in God. And we'll talk about that later on. وَلِأَنْبِيَائِهِ and with the prophets. وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ الْكَرَامِ and with the angels, the honorable angels. فَيَجِبُ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى عِشْرُونَ سِفَأَيْ يَجِبُ شَرْعًا So from the perspective of Sharia, and of course what is Sharia? The word Sharia is from the word Mashra'a al-Ibl, right? The oasis in the desert. We see people attacking Sharia all the time. They have no idea what they're talking about. And the interesting kind of caveat is there is we see these are people who tend to hold themselves above any legal code or system. You know, January 6th certainly comes to mind. And the treatment of, of black people in this country and others finding themselves above any legal system. So it's not just Sharia, it's anything that will hone in the nafs and discipline a person, and therefore they see that as a problem. But the word Sharia actually means كُلُّ مَا يُحَى اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِلَى كُلُّ مَا يُحَى إِلَى نَبِيِّنَا صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم. Everything revealed to Prophet Muhammad صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم, تُعْتَبَرْ شَرِعَ is considered Sharia. So what was revealed to the Prophet, so Quran and Sunnah, so yajibu fa yajibu lillahi ta'ala fa yajibu shar'an lillah. So the Sharia has made 20 ideas, 20 concepts about God obligatory upon us as Muslims. To make it easy, to make it simple for people. Fa yajibu lillahi ta'ala ishruna sifa. Maybe someone says, what about the 99 names of Allah? How many people know all the 99 names of Allah? Very few. What about all the verses in the Quran or the ahadith that talk about the sifat and af'ad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How many people memorize more than 10 hadith? So here we see the wisdom of the ulama that these 20 attributes encapsulate everything in the Quran and in the hadith about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the job of the ulama is to facilitate for people. That's why Sufyan al-Tawri, he said, any idiot can make things difficult for people, but it's the job of the scholars to facilitate. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he said, كَمَا رَوَاهُ مُسْلِمْ From Sayyidah Aisha, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ مُعَلِّمًا مُيَسِّرًا I was sent as a teacher to facilitate things for people. That's why Sayyidina Imam Madik ibn Anas, Imam Dari Tanzil, you know, there were certain things from the names and attributes of Allah that he didn't teach in front of the masses because they couldn't handle it. Imam Ibn Jawzi al-Hambari very clearly rebuked people who taught the masses, you know, the subtle difficulties, the scholarly issues related to theology. Sayyidina Imam al-Ghazali wrote a book, Il-Jam al-Awam, an ilm al-Kalam, right? Basically bridling the masses from engaging in these issues. That doesn't mean that there's something to hide. It just means that those things are not going to lead to amal, not lead to practice. And that's why, subhanAllah, uh, you, you know, we find Imam al-Bayjuri brilliantly in his explanation of uh, al-Jawhara, Jawhara al-Tawheed, you know, saying that what becomes an obligation upon a person in these issues is when they encounter these things, when they run into these questions, when they have these kind of issues pop up in their life, then these kind of more particular issues become obligatory. And that's why Imam al-Ghazali in Manhaj al-Abideen, when he talks about the three things you have to learn, and then he talks about what you have to learn, he says, initially is this stuff. But then if you encounter doubts in your life, or if you find yourself surrounded by people that have certain questions, like us maybe as new Muslims, our family members have a lot of questions. I remember sitting, you know, one time at the table and my mother said, what do you guys believe about angels? She doesn't want to hear all the detailed, in-depth Issues about malaika, just the foundational beliefs about malaika. So here when he says, فَيَجِبُوا شَرْعًا وَإِجْمَالًا That's what I heard from Sheikh Shankiti, right? That this is generally obligated, is to have a general understanding of these 20 things. Why? Because the 99 names of Allah, there's a difference of opinion, is the hadith authentic, this, this, this. People don't have time for that. 
So they don't have time to know the 99 names of Allah let alone do they have enough time to engage in kind of the deeper theological discussions about those names and attributes and so on and so forth. So the scholar said, look, we're going to zip file for you, Aqidah, into 20 things you have to know about God. Khalas. And one of the outcomes of living in this age, especially a post-colonial neo-Hellenistic age, is that we don't trust our ulama. And where does that lead people? On one side, you have groups like ISIS who kill ulama and deny their ulama any type of credibility. But then also the irony is that on the other side of it, the far irresponsible liberal side, they also don't believe in ulama. They don't have any respect for the ulama. And look where the ummah is now. So mashallah, these 20 things are meant to make it easy for you. Alhamdulillah. What were the ulama who, who kind of positioned these 20 things? For example, Imam Ar-Razi, Fakhruddin Ar-Razi, Imam Ahli Sunnah wal Jama'a, Sayyidni Imam Al-Ghazari, Radiyallahu Anhu, Al-Amidi, Radiyallahu Anhu, Al-Iji, Radiyallahu Anhu. So many of them, Ibn Rushd, you name it. Al-Qurtubi, Sayyidni Imam Siyuti, Sayyidni Imam Al-Nawi, Sayyidni Imam Ibn Hajar, even though their focus was in theology. Sayyidna Shaykh Zakaria Al-Ansari, Radiyallahu Anhu, Al-Azhar of old, Damascus, Morocco, Libya, Tunis, Sudan, Somal, Africa, most of Malaysia and Indonesia. Allahu Akbar. So we, we also have to realize that one of the goals of the current world is to break our relationship with our spiritual luminaries and our ancestors. But mashallah, Stick, stick, stick to that path, man. Stick to that way so that things are easy. You don't find yourself confused. So he said, فَيَجِبُوا لِلَّهِ تَعَالَىٰ عِشْرُونَ sifa, 20 things we have to know about God. And believe. وَهِيَ And they are. الْوُجُودِ We talked about it. Existence. إِنَّنِي أَنَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعَبُدَنِي وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي Everything he mentions in this text, there's a verse of Quran to support it. Allahu Akbar. So Allah says in the Quran that He exists. Well, Qidam, Allah has no beginning. Allahu la ilaha, Surah Al Hadid, Huwa al Awwalu wa al Akhiru. Allah has no beginning. Well, Baqa, no ending. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. No ending. Kullu man alayha fan. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, Mukhalafa tu lil hawadith. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in opposition to al-hawadith. What does hawadith mean? It's a plural of hadith. Hadith means something has a beginning and an ending. Sayyidina Shaykh Dardir, he says in al-Kharida, Huduthuhum wujuduhum ba'da al-qidam. Right, that the idea of something being hadith is that they existed after they didn't exist. Hal ata ala al-insani hinu min al-dahri lam yakun shay'an madhkura. There was a time when you and I didn't exist, now we exist. Allah says, كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ How could you disbelieve in Allah? وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا فَأَحْيَاكُمْ You were dead, then He brought you to life. ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ Then you will die. ثُمَّ يُحْيِيكُمْ Then you'll be brought to life. Resurrected. ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ Look at it. We know we were dead. We know we're alive. We know we're going to die. The only thing that people doubt is the, the, the last 25%. I mean, if you are a betting person, أَعُوذِ بِاللَّهِ 75% of it is done. The only thing left is 25%. This is what people are doubted in. But we know that we were dead. We know that we're alive. And we know we're going to die. This is what we call huduth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala مُخَارِفَةُ لِلْحَوَادِثِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in opposition to anything that we know that's created. Anything we know that has a beginning and an end. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. What's the evidence for that? وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوَنْ أَحَدٍ لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى And we talked about what that means, the three areas uh, that we understand that uh, through. And that's why we, we have severe differences with all religions on the face of the earth because every religion on the face of the earth, their God is hadith. Whether theoretically hadith or physically hadith. Christianity. The fact that God could be 
encapsulated in, inside a human body is huruth. That God slept, a'udhu billah, walked and talked, or had a son. This is all huduth. So now we see Islam is true in its affirmation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's transcendence. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. Wal qiyamu bi nafs. We talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's independent. Qiyam bi nafsihi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal wahdaniya. And that he's one in three areas. That takes us to now, alhamdulillah, the rest of the text, inshallah, which we're going to divide in two more, this part and one more part, and then we'll finish, inshallah. And he says, wal haya. And we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alive. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal ilmu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alimun hakim. Wa allamaka ma lam takun ta'lam. Wa kana fadlullahi alayka azima. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran that he's the all knowing, the wise. He says to Sayyidina Muhammad, we taught you what you didn't know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the blessing of Allah upon you was great. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala extracted us from the wombs of our mothers, we didn't know anything. And then he gave us sam'a wal basara wal afida, then he gave us the ability to hear and to see and to feel. Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, fahuwa al-alim. Well, irada, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a divine will that supersedes all wills. There's no will that can oppose his will. And all wills are the extension of his knowledge and his will. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, fa'alu lima yurid. Allahu Akbar. Well, qudra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all powerful. Wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir. It doesn't say, wallahu qadirun ala kulli shay. If you understand Arabic, doesn't say that Allah is powerful over all things. It says, and Allah over all things, nothing is left out, is Qadir. يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ He administrates and controls all things. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالسَّمْعُ وَالْبَصَرُ And he hears and he sees all things. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لا يخفى عليه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, nothing is hidden from Him. When we read in the Bible, for those people who say that Jesus is God, and then He says, "I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen." That's impossible for that to be God. That's impossible because there's no way that God can be ignorant. أعوذ بالله. Because ignorance means that there was a beginning and an end to the knowledge. It means that there is a shortcoming in the knowledge. And for those of you who aren't Muslim who are watching this, you know, one time I gave this book to a Christian woman in Georgia. I was at a summer camp. And she was like, you know, the fox going, Trump supporting kind of evangelical, nice lady. Um, but politically, you know, we certainly don't align. And after I gave her the book, mashallah, she came back the next day. Like my grandmother that went to the Church of Christ, I mean, she had notes like everywhere. Like she had read it, not only read it, notes. And she said something to me just after reading these qualities that we believe about God is found in the Quran and through the teachings of Sayyid al Aqwan, through the Prophet. She said, You know, in Christianity, we worship Jesus. We, we, we worship Jesus. But y'all, y'all worship God. And then she said, did I just say that? I said, yes, you did. You just said that. <laughs> she was like, man, you caught me. I said, well, at least you're honest. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. La ilaha illallah. It's right there in, in, in the biblical text. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees all things and hears all things. Inna Allah la yakhfa alayhi shay'un fil ardi wa la fis sama. 
And the reason for those of you who are students, he put knowledge before will and qudra and sam and basr is to remind you that in everything he does, there is transcendent perfect knowledge. And his will, some people say, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows better than we know. We talk about this, of course, in other classes. He says to Moses and Aaron, Musa and Harun, I'm with you. I see and hear all things. Wal-Kalam, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He speaks. Then the Shaykh, he says, wa kawnuhu ta'ala hayyan. That Allah is always alive. It doesn't just like was born or he's going to die. No, no. He is constantly living. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa aliman, constantly knowing. Wa muridan, constantly willing. He doesn't have good days, bad days. He doesn't rest on the seventh day. La, none of that. He is who he is. And maybe you're wondering, like knowledge, hearing, seeing. Remember, you have to interpret all of that under that first series of, a second series of attributes. The third is, so he knows, he sees, he wills, he lives, but in a way which is in opposition to things that are created, things that have a beginning and an end. So don't forget that. That that he's constantly alive, constantly knowing, constantly willing, constantly in control, constantly hearing, seeing, and speaking. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, fahadihi ishruna sifa. The Shaykh he says, these are the 20 things you have to know about God. That's it. What are they again? Pay attention. He exists, he has no beginning, he has no ending, opposition to creation. Creation is opposition to him also. Absolute independence, oneness, living, life, knowledge, power, hearing, seeing, speaking, constantly living, constantly knowing, constantly in power, constantly willing, constantly seeing, speaking, and hearing. How many is that? 20. The opposite of those 20 are what we have to deny. That's why Sahib Jawhar uh, al-Tawheed said, وَيَسْتَحِلُّ ضِدُّ ذِي الصِّفَاتِ فِي حَقِّهِ كَالْكَوْنِ فِي الْجِهَاتِ In a book, a small poem called Jawhar al-Tawheed, Imam al says that the opposite of these 20 is impossible, the things that we deny. So what did the Shaykh teach you? The 20 obligations. You have to believe as a Muslim that God exists, He has no beginning, He has no end, He's in opposition to creation, that He's independent, that He's one. You have to believe that He's alive, that He's knowledge, that He, that he has life. You have to affirm life to Him, knowledge to Him, will to Him, seeing to him, hearing to him, speaking to him, do you have to affirm that he's constantly alive, constantly knowing, constantly willing, constantly controlling, constantly hearing, seeing, and constantly speaking. Ishreen Sifa. The opposite, Ishreen Sifa. So in reality, how many obligations are there? 40. He mentions the 40 that we have to affirm, وَيَسْتَحِلُّ ضِدُّ ذِي الصِّفَاتِ Shaykh Laqani in Jawhar al-Tawheed says, and what you have to hold as improbable and unacceptable to believe about God are the opposites of those 20. What would they be? So let's go through it quickly. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, the opposite, non-existence. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning. The opposite of that will be al-wilada, or al-huduth. Right, that he he would be born or come into being in some way. 
The third, al-baqa, no ending. The opposite of that would be al-maut, death. The fourth, mukhalafatu lil hawadith, in opposition to creation. The opposite of that would be tashbi o tamthil, partial likeness or complete likeness to Allah, or that Allah has a partial or complete likeness to His creation. It's an opposition to mukhalafatu lil hawadith. The fifth, qa'im bi nafs, independence. The opposite of that would be iftiqar or faqr, that He would need something. Indahu haja, that he would have some kind of poverty or need. The sixth, al wahdaniya subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the seventh, al wahdaniya is that Allah Azza wa Jal is one. The opposite of that is shirk. Ah, so now you expand to the idea of tawheed. In many ways, shirk means association through his attributes, his actions, or his essence. A'udhu billah. Then we continue to the next, life, the opposite of that will be death. Knowledge, the opposite of that will be ignorance. A will, the opposite of that would be he has no will. That he is all powerful, the opposite of that will be that he's weak. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then hearing, seeing, and speaking, the opposite of that would be their opposites. Then the final, that he is constantly living, the opposite of that will be sometimes he's alive, sometimes he's dead, a'udhu billah. That he's constantly knowing, the opposite of that will be sometimes he's ignorant. That he's constantly willing, sometimes he, his will isn't there, some, there's another will that, that runs creation in the universe, a'udhu billah. The opposite of constantly hearing and seeing, that he's not. And then of course constantly speaking, that he's not. So the Shaykh he says about what I just said, فَهَذِهِ عِشْرُونَ sifa. And then he mentions their divisions. We have names for these different categories of attributes of Allah Azza wa Jalla. We provided evidence from the Quran for each one. For each one. He said, Sifat al-Ula Nafsiyah. The first one, al-Wujud, is called Sifat Nafsiyah or Sifat Wujudiyah. What are the five after it? Uh, no beginning, uh, no ending, opposition to creation, independence, and one, oneness. Those are called salbiya. Why? Because they're opposites. If you infer them, it's impossible for you to affirm those opposites and then God be God, God be transcendent. Right? If you say God has a beginning, God has an end, there's no more transcendency for the salbiya. Mutasallib means to be like constantly a negative person. If I hear salbiya means the negative attributes, the opposite of these, right? They um, automatically uh, denote them or like deny them, excuse me. Wasabatu ba'daha sifat ma'anin. And the seven after that are called sifat ma'anin. We can talk about what that means in the future. وَالَّتِي بَعْدَهَا مَعْنَوِيَّةِ And what comes after those is called مَعْنَوِيَّةِ فَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّا نَكْتَفِي بِهَذَا إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى We have two more sessions, hopefully, uh, and we'll finish this text. بَارَكَ اللَّهُ فِيكُمْ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّا This is very important. So we took the 20 obligations, Sifat Nafsiyah, Sifat Salbiyah, Sifat Ma'an, Sifat Ma'nawiyah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yuwafiqna wa iyyakum wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.